that will be preached on in a moment is John 3, 4 through 7. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? He cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born, can he? Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not be amazed that I said to you, you must be born again. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for causing us to be born again. Thank you, God, for the gift of music and the chance to sing together in unison your word back to you. Thank you for your deep love and for the great things you've done and for the fact that you've paid it all. Thank you, Lord, that um, your word has power to change hearts, including those you've sanctified, that you've, that you've redeemed and are being sanctified, and as well as those that are dead. Um, thank you for the truth of this passage. Please be with Pastor Carl, that he may think clearly and that all the preparation he has put in um, would affect us through the power of your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank you so much, music team. So fun and wonderful to hear you all sing. We're going to be in John 3 as we continue our, our study of the life of Christ, so you can move your way there uh, if you like. The narrative of the Bible from Genesis to Revelation is a story of the glorious sovereign God and his victory over his arch enemy, the serpent, Satan. The written history plays out, as you know, on the pages of Scripture. In Genesis, God created the universe in six days, and on the sixth day, He created Adam and Eve. And you'll know, if you've spent much time thinking about this, that Adam was the pinnacle of creation, uh, specifically called out or, or made that pinnacle by being made in the image, the image of God alone. And God gave Adam, the king of the earth, dominion over that earth. And that is the storyline of the scripture. God living with man as king over the dominion that he had given him. And we see a short picture of that in the Garden of Eden. One day, though, as God would have been walking day in and day out with them in the cool of the garden, uh, that day went horrifically awry. You see, friends, because God is eternal, He is holy, He is all-powerful, He is all-knowing, and He is all-present, it is impossible for Him to tell a lie. And God had made a promise to His newly appointed King Adam, telling him that he could eat from any tree in the garden except the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And God promised Adam, saying, for in the day that you eat from it, you will, what? surely die. It's a promise, is it not? The first promise we find in the text between God and man, don't do this or you will die. Now that, my friends, was a life or death promise. And for Adam, the promise forgotten and the testing of God's holy character turned out utterly disastrous, as we know, for the king and the earth that he had been entrusted to care for. And if you're careful and you don't get so weighed down between the book of Genesis and the book of Revelation, what you will notice is that God created a king to be over this wonderful earth and give it stewardship and live with him and be in the presence with him. And all of this stuff in the middle is because of sin. But at the end, what's going to happen in Revelation 21? But a new heaven and a new earth and a new kingdom where man will once again rule and reign with Christ. In heaven. Really, it's pretty simple. The two ends of the book say the same thing. Amen? But oh, the middle. The middle, right? That covers the sin. God had made a life or death promise to Adam. And Adam tested God's holy character. And and it was a disastrous outcome where God ushered in life to all creation. Adam, being bitten by the serpent Satan, ushered in death, disease, and destruction. 
Friends, if we learn nothing else from today's time in God's Word, let us be reminded of this, that God keeps His promises. And forgetting God's promises is the difference between life or death. Can we remember that? (laughs) It seems so simple, yet we so quickly move away from the things God has promised us or given us uh, to do. And we forget and we go about and we do the things we want to do. And usually they cause destruction in our lives, do they not? And then really when we come back to it and if you have a good biblical counselor, they just bring you right back here to the Word and you you figure out where it is that you got off the path that God said to get off the path and you go, oh, right? (laughs) And you get back on. If you're visiting Capital City Church this morning, you are joining us as we teach and preach our way through the life of Jesus Christ by harmonizing the four Gospels. It's a little different for us, but we'll be doing this for probably likely a couple years. Um, The whole series is aptly titled The Life of Christ. We have studied how Jesus became flesh and dwelt among us, the ministry of John the Baptist, and we are now in a sub-series titled The Authentication of the King. In other words, what is authenticating this new message and this new messenger, Jesus, uh, to the world of Israel and all those who would pass by? We are firmly planted in the Gospel of John as he is the only Gospel writer, not the only one with Jesus, but the only Gospel writer who was an eyewitness to Jesus' early Judean ministry. John was an eyewitness, you'll remember, to the miracle of turning water into wine at Cana, and the subsequent cleansing of the temple along with observing many miracles at Passover A.D. 30. If you're tracking along or you're trying to think maybe chronologically, I think it's, it's, it's pretty easy to say that, that all of this, these chapters, chapter 1, 2, and 3 in John's gospel are all happening in the first 30 days of Jesus' ministry, the only one to cover them. And friends, as we'll see today in chapter 3, Jesus' miracles pointed to, they authenticated him as one who had come from God to present an eternal life or death decision. We often get hung up and we look to the, to the majesty and the miracles in the scripture, and we should. They should get our attention, right? They're not normal. They're not meant to be normal. But if you do a study on the miracles and what God is doing through, through the men of the Old Testament and through Jesus and through the apostles later, is he's doing miracles through them to authenticate, not their apostleship or that God is cool, (laughs) but because the message of which they are teaching. It's not any, it's to get our attention so that, that we will pay attention. What is being said? What is being said? It's the authentication of the king. Like Adam, who had forgotten, um, Uh, forgotten God's promise, this life or death decision that Jesus is going to bring about by the authenticating and in the miracles that he is doing. Like Adam, who had forgotten God's promise, which forever changed the future of humanity, today we'll see that same pattern perpetuated. Nicodemus, in today's paragraph, represents first century Jewish religious thought and a people, listen here, who had forgotten a life or death promise. By and large, the, the, the Jewish religious leaders are, are no doubt, they just like today, I would be some reflection of your re- uh, theology in this church. And just like then, those Jewish leaders, they, they, they would be a reflection of what the theology of Israel was at the time. And so we focus in here on one of the most important teachers and maybe one of the most familiar people to our ears in the New Testament, making a life or death promise. God has done here. Beloved, the big idea that we must grasp today is that forgetting God's promise is the difference between eternal, glorious life with our Creator or eternal punishment and death. Let's take a look at John 3, 1 and 2, and we find there the situation. Verse 1 starts with now, and we can pause there and remember to to stay in the context of this. And I think we are so familiar with John chapter 3 that we, we, we very quickly dissolve ourselves of everything that's going on. John 3 is, is, uh, uh, is happening in this larger narrative that started all the way back in John 2 at Passover, and we need to keep ourselves there. We need to understand that it is not just set, of, 
set apart as some strange, disconnected thing. It is part of the narrative that started in chapter 2. The paragraph is that, uh, 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 that um, narrative that revealed that Jesus left Capernaum with his five disciples to go up to Jerusalem for the Feast of Passover. You'll remember that he cleansed the temple from the wicked businessmen and he drove them off the Temple Mount, which was meant, remember, to be a house of prayer for the nations and not a den of thieves. This action, of course, got the attention of the religious leaders, and we talked a little bit about that a couple weeks ago. They're all probably likely getting kickbacks from the money that's coming in from all the wicked business that's going on on the Temple Mount. And so the religious leaders are listening to this. They're trying to figure out, you'll remember, who Jesus is. And they ask him, what authority do you have to do these things? And Jesus said, tear this temple down and I will raise it in three days. He was, of course, referring to his death and resurrection. And, and in other words, the sign of his resurrection was the sign of his authority. Because the Passover feast lasted seven days, we noted last week in verses 23 through 25 in chapter 2, that Jesus was doing miraculous signs which caused some to believe in him. However, we also noted that verse 24 said that although they had believed in Jesus and believed in him, their, Jesus himself was not believing or entrusting himself to them. They were unbelieving believers, and we talked about that last resurrection day. In other words, for the first but not the last time we ran into false converts or people we might think of as false Christians who were in the Gospel of John. And we'll see that, and, and John points that out all the way through uh, his Gospel. You get to John chapter 6, and, 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 and John is going to record the feeding of the 5,000. It's one of two miracles that's covered by all four Gospels that should get our attention, beloved. Right? Only the resurrection and only the feeding of the 5,000 find its way into all four Gospels. And what happens in that moment, but, but, but two fi or a couple of fish and loaves right, are, are being multiplied to feed the thousands. And in the end of that long, long chapter, Jesus says, I got something for you. Eat my, eat my flesh and drink my blood or you won't inherit the kingdom. And what does it say? All those believers left. And even his disciples at that point were like, whew, I can't handle that. What do we do but turn to you, O Lord? Thousands of people will come to Jesus wanting something from Jesus, needing something from Jesus, wanting Jesus to fulfill their needs and get everything they can from Jesus. Yet he's going to say in the end of the age and, and recorded in the Sermon on the Mount, go away from me, I never knew you. And here we saw last week that there are unbelieving believers beginning to show up in the gospel of John. It is in that setting of the seven days of Passover that notice in verse 1, one of those non-believing believers enters the narrative. Look there. It was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. Now we noticed this before, beloved, and if you're familiar with your New Testament, you will know that the Pharisees are a religious group deeply embedded in first century Jewish religious life. Any town you might know, including outside of Israel's boundaries that had 10 Jewish men could have a synagogue. The Pharisees were uh, uh, the authority. They were the lawyers in the synagogue and, and the standard bearers of the whole Testament. In effect, they were the celebrities in the town. They had they had a, a certain amount of religious garb that they would put on each, each Sunday. It would recognize them for who they were as a teacher and, and what sect of the Pharisees that they were coming out of. They were no doubt the people's heroes. They were the people, and they had been teaching in the synagogues that, that you've got to keep the law or you're not going to inherit the, the greatness of the kingdom. Why is Nicodemus in Jerusalem? Well, quite simply, it is Passover. And second, notice there, he is a ruler of the Jews. Being a ruler of the Jews is likely a reference to being a member of the Sanhedrin or what we might call the Supreme or a Supreme Court Justice of the United States. I might pause and just think for a second 
about this, that the Pharisees, and, and we, we so, I don't know, we, we read so much back into our text, beloved. We just have to pause. You've got to understand. you got to remember that when, when, when Israel is coming out as slaves out of Egypt, they're coming into a land, they're given the law. This is, this is like our law. This is like the Constitution of the United States, right? Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. It's their law. It's how they're supposed to operate in the land. And these Pharisees are the lawyers, right? They are keeping track, making sure that the law is being followed. Understand that about the Pharisees. It's important for us to understand and, and know that the kind of authority that, that uh, Nicodemus would have had. So he's there. He's there because it's the Passover and he's a ruler of the Jews, likely a member of the Sanhedrin, which was a mixture of, of uh, Pharisees and, and others who uh, made what would be a Supreme Court type of person. In first century Israel. As a matter of fact, in verse 10, Jesus will refer to Nicodemus as, and you might want to underline this, I think it's important, it's in the Greek text, he is the teacher of Israel. You might want to underline it. This is his high position. He's understood as one of the guys, right? One of the few. He's on the team. Effectively, if this is correct, Nicodemus is the highest class of lawyer, both in knowledge of the Old Testament and in personal observance to it. In our vernacular, we might think of him something kind of like this, and I apologize for the silliness of this, but maybe this will get our American mind's attention, where there are many professional football players who have become elite in the National Football League. There are only a few who receive the honor of being placed on the all-star team. This was Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews, an all-star, a celebrity of celebrities, or a Pharisee of Pharisees. He's a lawyer of lawyers, a Bible student of Bible students, so to say. There was ever such a person who could earn himself a spot in the kingdom, no doubt. It's Nicodemus. Now, for my generation, we'd say he's the Michael Jordan of basketball. And I think Steph Curry is probably the Michael Jordan of basketball now, but I don't watch basketball. You get what I'm saying, right? Is he? I don't know. Somebody affirm or deny that? Watch basketball? I don't know. Anyway, you get it, right? He's up there. He is the teacher of Israel. And like all sons of Abraham or people of Jewish descent in the first century, Nicodemus believed that being Jewish alone meant that he would inherit the eternal kingdom of God. His rise in stardom would for him mean that he would be more revered in that eternal kingdom to come. He would have more responsibility, more honored. And as we're getting ready to see, as smart as Nicodemus was, he had forgotten the promise of God found on the pages of his Old Testament. Say scrolls, probably. And as verse 2 says, follow along there. This man, Nicodemus, came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you have come from God as a teacher, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. It is worth noting that the ruler of the Jews, this is Nicodemus, recognizes Jesus here as Rabbi. And Rabbi, as most of you know, means a teacher. And in this context, Nicodemus is most certainly recognizing Jesus as a teacher of the law and the prophets. And much like today, back then, a teacher was respected and known by the school that they attended. We think of our Ivy League schools today and, and somebody who's graduated from uh, Stanford or Harvard Law Schools or, or maybe Princeton or other places that, that come to mind, right? Uh, we think of as that's, that's a, a more rigorous education, and we think of them more highly, and, and that, is, that is no doubt what's going on with all the religious leaders. Yet here, the teacher of Israel looks at Jesus, who has come from Nazareth of, no, of all places that nobody knows and nobody cares about, and, and it's an obscure name, right? And he looks to Jesus, and he recognizes him as teacher, rabbi. But simply the signs, the miracles that Jesus was doing was authenticating his authority to teach, and they didn't know what to do with him. He didn't come from the Ivy League schools. He didn't come up under Rabbi so-and-so or Rabbi Big Britches. I wanted to get your attention in case you were falling asleep. But it was those signs that he had seen back in verses 23 through 
25 that we're drawing attention and, and getting his attention. In conclusion, Nicodemus is a man who by birthright and self-righteousness, uh, he was committed to his religion. And it assumes that he will inherit this eternal kingdom of God no matter, no matter what school uh, Nicodemus had gone through, he was thinking that he himself would inherit. So Jesus complicates this entire situation and, and becomes the teacher. And, and some commentators note here uh, in, the, in the study that where Nicodemus starts by sp- speaking a lot at the front end of this paragraph, he is speaking very little by the end. And some would note and think that that is because he is recognizing the truth in what Jesus is saying. So Jesus complicates this situation, a promise forgotten, to Nicodemus in verse 3. And just like every promise God has made in his scripture, including those to Adam and Eve, God will keep his promise. Where Adam and Eve had forgotten a promise and ushered in death, disease, and destruction, Nicodemus, as we will see, had forgotten God's promise, which would bring new life and eternal life. Look there in verse 3. Jesus began or answered and said to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Friends, I I can't tell you that after that statement Jesus makes to Nicodemus that his jaw didn't hit the ground and his teeth fell out. I mean, I'm not kidding here. The idea that Jesus would say, you, the teacher of Israel, born a Jew, and have raised yourself to, the, to the, the highest court of the land where you know the law and you're walking in the ways, you're not going to make it, he says. Can you imagine? It's a jaw-dropping moment. A jaw-dropping moment. Friends, there can be no more severe warning against religion than this reality. Nicodemus, he was born a child of the promised land. He was entrusted to uphold and given an impeccable example of following God's laws. Yet Jesus says here that he will not inherit the eternal kingdom of God. He was one of those unbelieving believers found in in chapter 2, verse 24. And let me say this, Nicodemus, a, a Jew of Jews, a Pharisee of Pharisees, a lawyer of lawyers, a most valuable player on the all-star team in Jewish law and life, cannot earn his way into the eternal kingdom of God. If he cannot do it, there is no chance you and I would ever earn our way into the eternal kingdom of God. Jesus breaks with their tradition. He breaks with the the history of their religion. And he says, lest this happen, lest you be born again, you will not inherit the kingdom. And friends, all Too often, people who call themselves Christians fit into this category of unbelieving believers. They think their association with their church, their membership, being born to Christian parents, or having a recognition of Jesus will save them. Maybe they prayed a prayer, or they got baptized, or never missed a day of church, but as we will see in our text to come, Nicodemus was an unbelieving believer who needed, just like you and I, to be born again. This is the statement. As we talk to people, as we share the gospel with people, it, I think less so now than it used to be in America, most of the time you would run into people who would identify themselves as Christians. And then it gets really confusing. They talk about where they were baptized and what church they grew up in and all these things. And you can cut to the chase just like Jesus did and said, when were you born again? And you should. If you love them, you will. You will say, when did your life start over? When did the Spirit of God come and take up residence in your heart and, and, and no longer it was, I didn't sin because I'm not supposed to sin, but I don't, I'm not going to sin because the, the Spirit of God lives in me and I don't want to. When did that start? When did new life happen? You see, Nicodemus, he was blinded by his religion. He thought he was fine. Everybody told him he was fine, but Jesus, loving him, said, You're not fine. You're not fine, Nicodemus. So, beloved, as we're sharing the gospel with people, if you're in here this morning and you just think you're fine because of some kind of weird thing that I've already described here, baptism, a prayer, or whatever, but there is no born-again life inside your life, please take on this warning sign. You will not inherit the kingdom of heaven. 
lest you be born again. Lest you be born again. This born again language is something Nicodemus, the teacher of Israel, should have been aware of, but it was the promise forgotten that would cost Nicodemus eternity if he did not listen to Jesus. And like Adam and Eve's failure that had life and death consequences, so does this forgotten promise. So does this forgotten promise. Take a look at Nicodemus's confession and confusion about the born-again language in verse 4. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? He cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born, can he? Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. The second time he's been told, right? Now, friends, here was the lesson from the real most valuable player on the playground of Israel at the time. Jesus reminded the teacher of Israel of a promise Nicodemus had forgotten. In doing so, like Adam and Eve, this forgotten promise had eternal consequences of life and death. The promise forgotten is found in the prophecies of Ezekiel 36 and Jeremiah 31. You might write those two cross-references down in your Bible as many believe that uh, the reference there to water is that of either physical birth or baptism. In Ezekiel 36 and in Jeremiah 31, is going to help you clean that up and clear that up just a little. We're going to get to looking at them in just a minute here. But I think it's important that we understand when Jesus is speaking to Nicodemus, we must understand that he is steeped in the Old Testament. He is steeped in the prophecies. He is steeped in God's Word. And when Jesus is saying this, we, we tend to come to it, right, as Christians, knowing baptism and knowing all these other things, and, and we call the breaking of water something that happens before a baby comes and, and all this, and we read all that into this text. But I'm going to argue today with, and say that that's not what Nicodemus is hearing. He is he, hearing straight up out of the Old Testament, and he's, he's hearing Jesus remind him of what Ezekiel said, of what Jeremiah said, and why did it matter what those two said? If you'll remember Israel's history, right, you'll remember that, that God had promised them back in Deuteronomy, if you continue to sin and serve idols, I will kick you out of this land. And what did God did when they sinned and continued to serve idols? He kicked them out of the land. And Jeremiah and Ezekiel are on the latter part of that, and Babylon is coming in to, to, to overthrow that land. And no doubt that what is on the mind of the prophets, what is on the mind of the people is, well, I thought we had an eternal promise that we would inherit this land. What's going to happen? The, the temple's going to be gone. We're going to be kicked out of here. We're going to be exiled out of here. And Ezekiel comes along, and Jeremiah comes along, and and, and they tell us, and they begin to tell us these things. And Ezekiel um, is, is going to say in Ezekiel 36, verse 25 and 26, it says this, I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from all your idols. Moreover, I will give you a new heart, and I will put a new spirit within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. What is Jesus referring to? He's not referring to baptism. He's not, he's not referring uh, to, to, to anything other than teaching the teacher of Israel, get back to the promise. You knew that there is something new coming in light of the, the temple being destroyed and being cast out of this nation. There is a new heart. There is, I'm going to cleanse you. And here comes the new covenant. If you want, you can take a look. It might help you up there. Uh, in verse 5, in the Greek New Testament, um, it does not say water and the Spirit, but water and Spirit. It might help you to understand that Jesus is pointing to a single event that's going on, and Ezekiel is saying, I sprinkle you with water, and I will cleanse you from all your filthiness. I will give you a new heart and a new spirit. It's one thing that is going on here that God is after. Beloved, Jesus effectively tells the most qualified teacher in Israel to remember God's promise in Ezekiel, to enter into the eternal kingdom. One would have to be reborn. He would have to be cleansed with water and spirit and given a new heart and a new spirit. Notice verse 6. 
Jesus follows up with this language from Ezekiel, saying this, that which is born of the flesh is flesh. Friends, that which is born of the flesh is the dead heart of stone inherited from Adam's forgotten promise, which brought death to all humanity. And that which is born of the Spirit is again a reference to to verse 26 in Ezekiel 36, where the Lord promised that he would give ethnic Israel a new heart and put a new spirit within them. He's speaking what he is speaking in, in, in Nicodemus's language. Not speaking in ours, not confused by baptism. He's saying, don't you know, Nicodemus, that after we're exiled out of this land, the promise was to receive a new heart? It's now. It's coming. It's here. Notice how the Apostle Paul refers to being born again in Titus chapter 3, verses 4 through 6. But when the kindness of God our Savior and His love for mankind appeared, pay attention here, He saved us not on the basis of deeds. That throws Nicodemus' whole thought out, right? Which we have done... It, in righteousness, but according to his mercy, right? We don't deserve mercy by the what? Washing of regeneration. Notice how Paul ties it together. He understands that the new heart, the new spirit, right? It's a washing. It's a cleansing. It's a new life. It's, it's literally this wild language. Are you born again? Did your old self die? Is your new self alive? If not, don't miss the kingdom. You must Be born again, beloved. He saved us not on the basis of deeds, by the washing of regeneration, listen here, and renewing by the Holy Spirit. Verse 6, whom he, here's here's more water, more water imagery, whom he poured out upon us richly through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Beloved, Nicodemus was an unbelieving believer, and he, just like every human that wants to inherit the eternal kingdom of God, needed to be born again. He needed to be cleansed with water and spirit. So Jesus said to him in verse 7 and 8, Do not be amazed that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but you do not know where it comes from and where it is going. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. This flies in the face of Nicodemus thinking, all will be well because I'm Jewish, and all will be well because I have made my way onto the Supreme Court. Nope, don't get confused here, Nicodemus. Just because you were born Jewish does not mean that you will have the Spirit of God. God's Spirit is going to go where He wishes because, let me tell you, (laughs) He's God, not us, right? He gets to do what He wants to do because... He is the Lord. He is the Lord. He effectively says, Jesus here, that God alone directs that wind of the Spirit. And when one is born again, the new life that they live is proof, like the wind that changes the landscape of the earth and cannot be tracked. The Holy Spirit cannot be tracked and changes the landscape of the heart of whoever and whatever man he so chooses. He is God, beloved. And beloved, just like we had no agency in our physical birth, I think that's something to think about as we think about our salvation and the, the doctrine of our salvation. There is no human being in here that got to choose their parents. Not one. Not one. There was no human being that got to choose the time of their birth. Just like that, Jesus is saying, the Spirit of God is going to give life to whom he gives life to. To whom he gives life to. Notice the agent who is going to accomplish the work of the new covenant. Ezekiel 36, I'm going to sum these up for you, but I just want us to to understand that we are the recipient of the new birth. We are the recipient of the new birth. Ezekiel 36, verse 24 through 36, the Lord is speaking through Ezekiel of the new birth in Israel's future promise saying this in verse 24 I will take you from the nations verse 25 I will sprinkle clean water on you and I will cleanse you from all your filthiness 
I will give you, verse 26, uh, a new heart and put a new spirit within you, and I will remove the heart of stone from you, <coughs> from your flesh, and give you a heart of flesh. 27, I will put my spirit within you. 28, I will be your God. 29, I will save you from all your uncleanness. Verse 36 sums the whole paragraph. I, the Lord, have spoken, and I, you could say here, will do it. <laughs> He's going to do it. He's not going to forget his promises. He's not going to forget them to Israel, and he's not going to forget them to you. I will do it. And we can be thankful for that, right? Why is it that we get so confused and think we need to help the Lord? Right? Every time I think I need to help the Lord, I find myself needing counseling from the Word of God. He will do it. He will put his Spirit in us. We need to be patient with one another, knowing that, that sin is like like a disease, it is, the, it is a, the venom bitten by the snake, right, that affects each and every one of us. And so as we walk together in Christianity, we, we bear, as the New Testament says, we bear with one another. Why do you have to bear with one another? Because sin exists. But guess what? I, the Lord says, I will accomplish it. I will give you a new body. I will resurrect you. I will do away with sin forever. And we will live together in eternity. Amen? That's cool. You better hope that I, yourself saying, I will do it, gets out, of, gets out of the realm pretty quick, right? Because there's not a lot we get to do very well. You see, beloved, Nicodemus had done what we often do. He had remembered the things of the Scripture that he wanted to and forgotten the promises of God. Since Israel was, uh, had been exiled from the land uh, and, and uh, he, it was bringing this end to the old covenant era, Nicodemus, along with the nation, should have been expecting to be cleansed, given a new spirit and a new covenant. It was the next thing on the prophetic timeline. We've been judged. We've been cast out. It's the next thing on the prophetic timeline is to get a new heart and new spirit. That's what he should have been looking for. As a matter of fact, Ezekiel's contemporary, you'll remember, uh, and that is the man prophesying at the same time as Jeremiah. He had also been given the promise of a new heart and a new spirit. In Jeremiah 31, verse 31 through 33, it states this, Behold, days are coming, declares the Lord, when who will? When I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Beloved, don't forget this. <laughs> Hold on just a second. Jeremiah is prophesying, Ezekiel is prophesying, Daniel is prophesying. All of this is happening because they, they had disobeyed and had worshipped idols and God had kicked them out of the land. And God is now speaking through his prophets and, and he's saying, okay, yep, you broke the rules and you're getting kicked out of the land because, listen here, I keep my promises, but guess what? I'm going to put a new heart in you and I'm going to put a new spirit in you and I'm going to bring you back from the nations and I'm going to place you here. Jeremiah says, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. 32, not like the covenant. So we don't have to pause too long, right? It's not going to be like the Mosaic covenant. Something is different about it which I made with their fathers in the day that I took them in the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant, which they broke. Although I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. Verse 33, pay attention here. But this is the covenant which I will make. And revel in the reality that God's going to make it, right? I can't keep my promises from right now until the end of lunch, probably. I usually can't make up my mind what I want to eat. Say one thing and then tell the waitress, can you change that? God's going to do it. Which covenant I will make with the house of Israel after those days. What are the days? The days of exile. The days when you've been cast out. I'm going to do something new, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them, and on their heart I will write it, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Beloved, God keeps his promises. Do you know them? Have you, like Nicodemus, let some religious tradition talk you out of the promise of God of being born again? Have you put your faith in some prayer you prayed as a kid or some baptism you did, but there is no life, there is no new life in you? Don't forget the promise of God. 
It's life or death. It's life or death. Verse 9, Nicodemus said to him, how can these things be? Jesus answered and said to him, are you the teacher of Israel and do not understand these things? Right? That's, That's pretty heated. Don't you know that we've been exiled? Don't you know the next thing coming on the timeline is a new covenant? Don't you, aren't you expecting that God is going to give you new life and write his law on your heart and you're not going to be, have a heart of stone, but you'll have a heart of flesh and you will feel and, and your whole life will change? Nicodemus, how can you not know this? You teach the whole nation. Verse 11, truly, truly, I say to you, we speak with what we know. That is, one must be born again. The new covenant must come. Right? You must be cleansed by water and spirit and testify of what we have seen. And do you not accept our testimony? And beloved, verse 12 and 13 continue to assert Jesus' authority as the Son of Man who not only did signs and miracles, but where does it say he came from? Heaven. Not like you. Father has sent me. Friends, Nicodemus was a religious elite who did not accept Jesus' testimony about being born again to enter the eternal kingdom of God. He had put his faith in religious tradition and he would need to be born again if he desired the eternal kingdom of God where he, like Adam and Eve, would one day walk with God again in the cool of the day. Amen? That promise, no doubt, is being extended to Nicodemus here and, and the verses in the weeks to come will will show that they are extended to us. Therefore, Jesus gave him the resolution to to Nicodemus' hellbound condition. In verse 14, it says this, As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so the Son of Man must be lifted up, so that whoever believes will in him have eternal life. (laughs) Once again, Jesus returns to the Old Testament to teach Nicodemus a lesson. This is the life they lived, right? This is the the books they memorized. What was the lesson? When Israel grumbled in unbelief in the wilderness, God judged them with death from relentless, remember this, venomous serpents. And as ridiculous as it may have seemed to Israel, in those tragic moments, they only had to muster up enough belief to walk themselves over uh, to the serpent, lift it up, and they would be delivered from their certain death. We might pause here for just a moment, and, and I think we so struggle in America with this idea of genuine belief. And we see the struggle even happening in our text, right? Believers who don't believe. And we could say to our, our kids all the time, you know, we, 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 we would often have a set of rules in our home, whether it was chores or things that were to happen, and they were, happen, they were to happen on certain days, and and so we could ask our, our kids, do you, do you believe that you were supposed to take the trash out on Thursday night? Oh, yeah, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. Did you take it out? <laughs> no, right? You all know that. Answer. They didn't believe that they had to take the trash out. They knew they needed to take the trash out. And ridiculous as it was, uh, God had made a promise. If you will just, if you've been bitten by one of the serpents, just walk over and look at this staff and you'll be healed. What's going on? It's the imagery Jesus is giving. But you had to get there. I got to believe as hard-hearted as so many people are as it comes to God, that there were those Israelites not recorded in the text who refused to make that walk. They knew it to be true. They knew God would do it, and others were being healed, but I will not do it. That is what we're running into with Nicodemus is what are we running into with unbelieving believers in the text? People who are following, people who know about Jesus but refuse to do the walk. Nicodemus had been misinformed about his eternal destiny because of his blinding religion. But God loved him like he does everyone made in his image and did not want to see him perish. Jesus encouraged Nicodemus by reminding him that no one inherits the kingdom of God without being cleansed, being born again, right? Washed in the water of regeneration, as Titus 
uh, was told and placed in the new covenant. As we will see next week through the most quoted Bible text ever in Western and New Testament history, that wonderful verse in John 3.16, the message of not being born again did not just stop with Nicodemus and Israel, did it? But was extended to the whole world, to you and I. Friends, we know that. We look at that, and my hope as we study into the life of Christ is to do a good job of pulling out the, the very moments that are going on then without forgetting what God has promised us. We have all been bit by the serpent, Satan. Because we've all died in Adam, we've all sinned. Because of that, we are all condemned to death because of that sin. Just like those Israelites who had been bit by those serpents, and that venom was running through their veins, and it was a matter of time before it killed them. We have all been bit by the serpent in Adam and Eve. We have all inherited sin. And will we walk up to the cross and put our faith in Christ? Will we not let the blinding nature of religion uh, tell us we're doing fine because we showed up once again to church? Will you ask the question, have I been born again? The Apostle Paul had not planned this here, but let me get there really quick. And in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 5, it says this, test yourselves to see if you are in the faith. He's writing to Christians. Make sure you're not an unbelieving believer. Test yourselves to see if you're in the faith. Examine yourselves, or do you not recognize this about yourselves, that Jesus is in you? Unless indeed... You fail the test. We look to our baptism, praise the Lord for those moments. We look to those moments that we give our life to Christ, praise the Lord for those moments. And then we all realize that we tend to walk away. And we struggle with that. And and everywhere, the Word of God is going to encourage us, test yourself. Were you born again? Is there a willingness to repent? Have you just believed the story because it's a good story and maybe it fits your your, 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 your conservative lifestyle better, but you've not been born again. Maybe you think you've got to be a Christian because you're a Republican. I don't know what goes through our minds, right? But that couldn't be further from the truth. It couldn't be. Test yourselves, friends. You've been bit by Satan. The venom is in your veins. Will you look to Christ? And believe the promise that said, whosoever believes will in him have eternal life. As ridiculous as it seems, we can look to Jesus who was lifted up on that cross and receive eternal life in God's coming kingdom. Beloved, the big idea that we have to grasp out of this text today is that forgetting God's promise is the difference between eternal glorious life with our Creator and eternal punishment and death. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word in this study of Nicodemus' life and your interaction, Lord, through Jesus with him. How it presses.